Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the WSPC RSIS virtual book launch of post-Soviet Russia, Life and Work. I am Henrik Tseng from RSIS and I have the pleasure to be your MC today. Before we start the event, let me share some housekeeping notes for all audience members joining us on Zoom. Firstly, please keep your camera and microphone turned off for the duration of the event. Secondly, please post your questions via the chat. And lastly, please note that this webinar is recorded and it may be shared publicly online. Today, we'll be launching the book titled Post-Soviet Russia, Life and Work by Mr. Chris Chiang, a senior fellow at RSIS. This book revolves around the professional and personal experience of a diplomat from Singapore living and working in Moscow, beginning in the aftermath of the USSR's collapse and ending in the first decade and a half of this century. The panelists you will hear today, you will hear from today will be discussing this book and hopefully elicit further discourse and thought from our audience and the book's readers. I would now like to invite Ambassador Ong Keng Yong, Executive Deputy Chairman at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies, to deliver his remarks. Ambassador Ong, please. Well, good afternoon, good evening, good morning. Everything good to all our friends and supporters out there. Thank you for joining us for this book launch. We are very pleased to see so many of you, and I'm sure Christopher Chang and uh, uh, Bilahari Kausikan are pleased with uh, catching up with many of their old friends in Russia and other parts of the world. We are officially launching the book Life and Work in Post-Soviet Russia, written by RSIS Senior Fellow Christopher Chang or we call him Chris. This event serves two goals. First, we want to introduce a book to you, the audience, and to the general public who may wish to pick up a copy of the book. Hitherto, the majority of the books, commentaries, and analytical articles on Russia in the English language has been dominated by academic experts, journalists, and others from what we call the Anglo-Saxon world. Chris' view of Russia, in which he lived and worked for almost 15 years, over three separate diplomatic postings in Russia between 1994 and 2013, provide the reader with a Singaporean perspective of Russia from the trolls it found itself after the collapse of the Soviet Union and communism in late 1991. To its return to stability and to the international stage in the first decade of the 21st century. So this is something quite extraordinary for me personally and for us here in the S. Rajaratnam School of International Study, RSIS, at the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. It's the first time we have someone from among our researching group here able to produce such a book and on such an important country. Russia's role and influence in the Asia-Pacific cannot be underestimated now or in the future. For sure, it faces serious domestic and foreign policy challenges. However, the fortitude, resilience, and collective strength of the Russian people will ensure that Russia remain a great power. Russia has weathered many heavy storms in the past, and there is no reason to doubt that it will overcome the severe impact of the coronavirus pandemic. The fall in 
energy prices and the serious geopolitical instability in the face of turbulence in US-China relations. In this regard, the second objective of this event is for participants to benefit from the assessments of the panel that we have assembled today. The panelists from Russia will give a assessment, give an assessment of Russia's relations with the Asia Pacific and how the Russian economy is expected to progress in the harsh environment we are facing today and in the coming year. We in Singapore and ASEAN, ASEAN is the regional grouping in Southeast Asia, consisting of 10 Southeast Asian countries, will definitely benefit to learn more about Russia and its development from the views of the panelists and their discussion following their respective presentation. We will also be having the question and answer session I hope all the uh, speakers will keep to time so that we can have good uh, questions and answer uh, with the audience so that we can learn even more. I hope there will be lots of good but short questions from the participants. Before I finish my remarks, let me thank Professor Alexei Puskov, Ambassador Tatarinov, and Ambassador Pranjit, Professor Lukin, Mr. Gavilekov, and my good friend Pina Harikausikan for the time and contribution they have given to bring Russia closer to all of us today. I also thank you all the participants out there for making time to join this book launch and making it the most memorable event. I think Chris Chiang is now uh, a very proud man. Uh, this book is going to be making him more uh, famous and I have to uh, start taking numbers to see him very soon. Thank you very much for your attention. May I now uh, proceed with the rest of the event? Uh, Hendrik, you want to take over? Maybe I'll let you do it since you are there. Okay. Okay. Uh, we now invite, thank you, Ambassador. We now invite Professor Alexei Pushkov, Senator of the Russian Federation and Chairman of the Commission on Information and Media on the Federation Council of the Federal Assembly of the Russian Federation to deliver his remarks. Professor Pushkov, please. Uh, hello, everybody. Do you hear me there? Yes. Good. Um, I would like to uh, welcome this uh, distinguished group of uh, professionals, um, some of whom I have met uh, in my lifetime, uh, either in Moscow or in Singapore, that I visited about 10 years ago, and still uh, keep the, the, the best impressions from, uh, from my visit, which was on the invitation of uh, 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 Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, uh, public, uh, uh, public school. Um, and um, uh, I uh, particularly uh, would like to express my uh, good feelings about uh, the uh, reason why we gathered today. Uh, the reason is uh, a very impressive book by my old time friend, Chris Chan, um, which could be titled as far as I uh, can judge, uh, the discovery of Russia. Uh, because uh, Chris uh, starts his book uh, citing his first contacts uh, about Russia and his first contacts in Russia, his first impressions. Uh, it's almost a Marco Polo experience, uh, but Marco Polo was discovering China. Uh, Chris uh, has discovered Russia 
and uh, he was so much impressed that uh, he uh, he spent uh, how many? Well, quite a few pages, quite a few pages to describe uh, what um, what his. Uh, um, experience was and what um, his uh, um, conclusions are uh, about Russia. I would like to, um, uh, stra uh, to, to, to support uh, uh, Chris' uh, uh, writing uh, because there are not so many books on Russia that have been written recently uh, outside of the Western, so-called Western world. I mean, uh, Germany, um, France, Great Britain, United States, and unfortunately, the what 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 we see uh, in uh, the studies by uh, European and American experts, it's very much uh, tainted by political approach and uh, by uh, some um, some very deeply ingrained uh, bias that has been always since, since the times of, of the Cold War impregnating. Uh, the approach of uh, Western experts to, uh, to Russia. Um, one of the examples uh, that I can give is that the Yeltsin period of uh, about 10 years from 91 to 2000 is usually described in uh, Anglo-Saxon political literature as a period of democracy, which would uh, lead the reader to come to the conclusion that it was the best time for Russia. In Russia, it is considered to be the worst time uh, in the second half of the 20th century, uh, because the, the, the social price for uh, Yeltsin uh, so-called reforms was, was enormous. Uh, and we have fallen uh, uh, to, um, for instance, the, the male longevity of life was 56 years in 1995, just to give you one figure. So, uh, a, a, an objective analysis of what has been going on in Russia for the last 30 years after the fall of the Soviet Union is badly needed. And uh, I can only express my joy at the fact that Chris has written an honest, uh, uh, multidimensional book uh, where he presents different points of view. Uh, I can see his own point of view through, the, through his writing, which is, which is very good. It's... Uh, uh, it's not just in uh, the book is uh, is personal, and uh, uh, taking into account Chris' 15 years experience uh, in Russia, it's good that it has this, this is personal dimension. Um, I'm I'm a little bit less optimistic uh, than than Chris in assessing Russia's relationship with uh, the Western Alliance in uh, in the coming in the coming years. And I'm afraid that uh, with the election. Uh, or with, uh, with the coming, rather, of uh, Joseph Biden to the White House, which is highly probable in the United States, and um, with the trends that are now, do now exist between Russia and, uh, and Europe, we are in for a long period uh, of, um, of a new Cold War, I would call it. Um, um, and the reasons, uh, reasons are very, very multiple. Um, the fact that Russia is a European uh, country, uh, culturally and historically, now, the fact that Russia is uh, a European power does not unfortunately uh, negate the fact that um, we have very, very much diverging interests and approaches uh, with our Western uh, counterparts. And in the last uh, 10 years, they have become uh, much more profound. Than, uh, than before. Um, so um, I think that Russia's relations with the West will depend not only uh, on the interaction between Russia's interests and Western interests, it will also depend on uh, the domestic developments in, uh, in the West and in Russia. And those developments are very dramatic because whatever Joseph Biden says, America is very fragile. The United States have a lot of domestic problems. And I, I, they have layers and layers of domestic problems. And uh, I don't think they will disappear with Biden coming to power. And uh, even if Trump is not more president, Trump is, will be present in the United States. And um, the Afro-American minority will claim for their rights. 
uh, and um, the, the social fabric of the American nation is, is very fragile. Um, look also at what happens in France, uh, where um, they have about 7 million Muslims uh, and uh, big, big uh, problems, uh, the internal problems, domestic problems, uh, cultural problems. Um, so I think that um, analyzing the relationship between Russia and the West and Russia and Asia, we should see not only foreign policy, we should uh, watch attentively and closely what is going on inside the West, what is going on inside the uh, main Asian actors, and what is going on inside Russia too. So I would say that the domestic policy dimension is becoming critical. Uh, to foreign policy, much more critical than it used to be, say, 20, 30 years ago. That would be my, my most general observation. I would like uh, to stop here. would like to, to thank uh, Chris for uh, publishing such an important book, which I hope will enjoy uh, the attention uh, of the audience, not only in Singapore, but outside of, of Singapore. Uh, I think it's, it's absolutely worth it. I would... Uh, on my part, recommend it to my, to my Chinese, Japanese, um, uh, Indian, uh, Pakistani colleagues I have today. In uh, one hour, I have a meeting of the ambassador of Pakistan and Moscow. I would also like to say that um, I have published a book uh, in France, which is called um, The Geopolitical Chessboard, The Russian Game, uh, which is my response, uh, in a way, to, to Chris's book. It appeared slightly before. Um, I would, if 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 it is now it is being translated in Italian. If it is translated in uh, in English, I will gladly send you a few copies uh, because I think that it's uh, this. My book has a very um, uh, close interaction with with Chris's book because it it is about the evolution of Russian foreign policy interests and about the evolution of Russia's understanding of international politics from uh, Gorbachev to Putin. So uh, I think that those, book, those two books uh, could uh, make a very good uh, couple. Uh, so I would like to thank you for, for your attention and uh, uh, one more time to uh, wish Chris's book uh, a long and happy life in uh, international universities and among uh, international experts. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pushkov. May I now invite Ambassador Andrei Tatarinov, the Ambassador of Russia to Singapore, to deliver his remarks. Ambassador Tatarinov, please. Okay, yes. So, uh, hello to everyone. I am Glad to see many familiar faces, and uh, it is uh, a pleasure to me to attend this book launch today. Uh, I have read the book with pleasure, and I want to express my deep appreciation of uh, Chris's initiative. Uh, you know, I, I was reading the book not only as ambassador to Singapore, but uh, as a career diplomat whose life has been connected with the Asia Pacific for several decades. And uh, uh, of course, I know Chris personally, he may remember me too, as uh, deputy director, then uh, director general for Southeast Asia. Uh, of course, the book is a very uh, valuable addition given that Chris is uh, unique in uh, having served in Russia for 13 years. I think this record will not be beaten in the near future by any of uh, Singaporean uh, diplomats. Actually, uh, the book uh, is uh, kind of uh, three in one. Uh, the discovery of Russia, as uh, Professor Pushkov put it, uh, the uh, bilateral relations between Russia and Singapore, and uh, actually Russian foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the West and, uh, and China. Uh, 
the personal observations of Chris are very valuable. Uh, the 90s was a very challenging time for uh, Russia. And uh, I want uh, to thank Chris for giving a very objective view based on his meetings and uh, uh, conversations uh, with Russian people from uh, different walks of life. He gives the view of the man in the street. He uh, often uh, refers to the man in the street opinion. So I think it is very interesting and it uh, reminded me of uh, uh, many events of this uh, challenging period in uh, the uh, Russian history. Uh, the second part, I think, is uh, very interesting given that uh, 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 Russia-Singapore relations have been developing rapidly in uh, the 21st uh, century. Uh, Chris uh, uh, failed to mention uh, one but important meeting, the first in-person meeting between then President Putin and uh, Prime Minister uh, Lee San Lun in December 2005 in uh, Kuala Lumpur on the sidelines of the first East Asia Summit. The meeting was short. I attended it, maybe half an hour, but it was kind of a catalyst. And uh, it was after this meeting that uh, the contacts between Russians and Singaporeans intensified uh, substantially. And uh, uh, another important meeting, it was mentioned, it was uh, in uh, 2008, uh, when both the Minister Mentor uh, Lee Kuan Yew and Senior Minister Go Chok Tong uh, were uh, in uh, Moscow. Uh, the meeting was uh, between the two and uh, uh, Mr. Sergei Narishkin, then Chief of Staff of the President. Actually, the Joint uh, Intergovernmental Commission was conceived at this meeting when uh, Minister Mentor finger pointed at Senior Minister Gochok Tong and said that this man will be in charge of Russian-Singapore relations in Singapore. I want that he had a counterpart. And Mr. Narishkin proposed that a joint commission uh, be uh, established as with many other countries. And this initiative materialized uh, the next year in 2009. Uh, so I think that uh, there is a demand for such books today. And if you come to a bookstore in Singapore, you will not find anything about Russia, uh, not to say anything good about Russia. This book gives a very objective and balanced view of uh, Russia-Singapore relations and many aspects of the Russian policy. But the last part, uh, Russia relations with the West, uh, is uh, more subjective, and uh, I think it's not uh, uh, incidentally that Chris uh, quotes uh, many foreign scholars uh, with uh, their view on relations between Russia and the US, uh, Russia and the West as a whole, uh, Russia and, and China. Uh, nonetheless, it is important that different views are presented in this book. So a keen reader, an interested reader, can, uh, makes, can make his uh, own conclusions. Uh, I value uh, the good job done by Chris, and I sincerely hope uh, that uh, uh, we will have a chance to meet after this launch, and uh, uh, Chris uh, will uh, sign a copy of this book for me. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. We now invite Ambassador S. Premjit 
the ambassador of Singapore to Russia to deliver his remarks. Ambassador Premjit, please. Thank you. A very good evening to all of you. I'm delighted to join all of you for Christopher Chiang's book launch by World Scientific today. I'm also happy to see my mentors, Bilari Kausikan and Hong Keng Yong, whom I've worked with for over 25 years. I would like to thank our four Russian friends, Professor Alexei Pushkov, Ambassador Andrei Katarinov, Professor Alexander Lukin, and Mr. F. Jenny Kavrilenkov for joining us on this panel and for their part in strengthening bilateral relations between Russia and Singapore all these years. Christopher is the go-to man on anything related to Russia in the Singapore Foreign Service. Before I was posted to Russia slightly more than a year ago, like many others, I too met Christopher to get his advice on how to navigate and learn from him. After answering the same questions from many different MFA officers, he must have decided to put it all in a book. Christopher's book is remarkable in three areas. First, as Professor Alexei Pushkov mentioned earlier, as well as Ambassador Tatarinov, this book provides a balanced first-hand account based on three tours of duty, of Christopher's three tours of duty in Moscow. To understand Russia today, we must understand the events that happened in Russia in the 1990s. Christopher was in Russia when these events happened. He called this period the difficult decade. Second, he pulled together a number of themes that remains relevant today. One theme is this uh, idea of disorder uh, in the 1990s 90s versus uh, order and stability that many Russians feel that uh, they have uh, secured today. Another theme is the economic devastation in the 1990s and the subsequent economic rebound or recovery. In 1998, for example, Russia had a negligible US $8 billion in reserves and today it has US $600 billion in reserves. Russia is now the 11th biggest economy in the world. At the same time, Christopher lists the main economic challenges facing Russia currently, and many of us, I think, agree with those challenges that he has characterized in his book. Christopher lists another recurrent theme in the book is Russia's disillusionment with the West, which I think the, some of the previous panelists have spoken about. This disillusionment with the West is pertinent as it helps explain the topsy-turvy nature of Russia-West relations today. Finally, this book is timely in the sense that we are witnessing a churn in the international order. The strategic rivalry between US and China is shaping the global power competition with Russia and the EU trying to find or secure a favorable position for themselves within it. For both Russia and the EU, the key question is whether they are able to move towards a path of managed coexistence and maximize their strategic space for maneuver or continue the Cold War path of hostility and post-2014 downhill trajectory as depicted in Christopher's book. How the Russia-EU relations evolve will have an impact on all of us, including on Southeast Asia. I hope these remarks have kindled in you an interest in the web of themes questions and choices in Christopher's book. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Mr. Chris Chiang, author of the book and senior fellow at the S. Rajaratnam School of International Studies will now deliver his remarks. Mr. Chiang, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, all of you, I'm actually uh, Normally, I'm not such an emotional person, but today I'm quite emotional. I'm not used to being praised all the time. But anyway, to be uh, serious, first of all, let me thank all of you for coming, for helping me, for helping us organize these events. And I have to say special thanks to my boss, Mr. Ong, Bilahari Kausikan, Mr. Tan Chin Tiong, who, like Mr. Bilahari, was the top civil servant in Singapore Foreign Ministry. He, as well as a, a late colleague of mine, Luigi Menon, she unfortunately died early this year, helped make my book better. I also like to thank all those people who have endorsed my book. There are at least 10 or 12 people. I, I guess age is catching up on me. I can't remember, but I think it's about 12, sorry. I would like to mention all of them, unfortunately, because of time constraints. I can't, but their names and their generous comments are found in my book. Uh, one of them is here, Mr. Evgeny Gavrilenkov. 
Uh, Yageni, you are listening. Thank you very much for your generous comments. Um, now, ha having never written a book on Russia or any country or anything before, I must also say it was quite a, a daunting experience. But in, that, in this sense, I must thank Mr. Ong for having given me a lot of time to work on this book. Let me just say some, the following about Russia, and I'll try to make it as fast as I can. Russia is a country which uh, I, or, or anybody who has lived there for the better part of a decade and a half, cannot forget. In fact, I, even if I try to forget, I can't. It is a country, I think, quite misunderstood by foreigners, including Singaporeans, by the way. I think uh, most Singaporeans read about Russia. Uh, of course, the sources, mainly foreign press, of course. Uh, and those who may be Chinese educated, they may be read Chinese sources, but they still, you know, Singaporeans really don't know much about Russia. I think a lot of people don't. Uh, I cannot say that I have become an infallible expert on the country, of course, but I, my long years there and meeting many people, including some of them here today, like Professor Pushkov, Mr. Garvi Lenkov, and of course, Professor Lukin, uh, Many people I met there, Russians, foreigners, Singaporeans, and one of them I think is here, Edwin Tam, who has also been there more than 20 years. And another foreigner, if I may mention fast, Chris Weaver. He's, a, he's, a, he's also one, I think, of the foremost authorities on the economy in Russia. He's also been there a long time. All these people, including the people I've met in my embassy, my, my fellow colleagues, they all gave me the knowledge to write about this book. Now, when I was there, of course, I didn't think I was going to write a book. So I didn't keep any diary. I didn't keep any journal. But the fact is that when I started working with this book three years ago, I sat down and I said, what the hell happened there? What, what happened to me? What happened to my wife? What happened to my daughter? What happened to the country? And it just came back. And it shows to me the indelible impression that the country left on me, my wife, who, by the way, speaks Russian too and is, uh, loves and admires the country like I do, the, imbel the indelible impression that the country left on me. Uh, I hope my book will provide the readers, my readers, with a Singaporean perspective, as, I, as you all, as uh, people have already said, Singaporean perspective, uh, throw some light upon the country, which uh, again, I say, I repeat, not, not many people know much about. Um, but in conclusion, I, I want to just say this, uh, if I may repeat myself, my knowledge of the country, the, the knowledge I gained would not have been possible had I not met everybody whom I met there. People, some of them, I can't even remember their names because I, unfortunately I lost contact with them. But again, those who, who, who are now present, like again, if I may mention Professor Pushkov, Evgeny Gavrilenkov and Mr. And Professor uh, Lukin, uh, they, among others, and I don't know whether some of the other people I met, including the foreigners there who, uh, and Singaporeans, I, have de I devoted a chapter, an entire chapter to, that, to, to their views. Some of them I can think on the screen here, if I may use this opportunity to thank them, like Edwin Tam, uh, Chris Reefer, uh, Alex Brooking, now, without these people, I would not have been able to write my book. So actually, I like to say I'm an expert on Russia, but I'm really not. It is because of other people, their knowledge, which they imparted to me, that I have become a so-called expert. Finally, I just think, let me make one, two, two final points. I would like to stress that I'm not a, an apologist for the country. Some people may think because I my book has not many criticisms of Russia, and I'm an apologist, I'm not one. I am neither an, apolog not an apologist nor an unrelenting and unforgiving uh, and blind critic. That what I, I'm certainly not that. I have criticized, I think, where I think criticism deserves to be mentioned, but I do not, I do not want to criticize for the sake of criticizing. However, I must add that no person no person can ever divest himself or herself of his or own 
or her own ingrained prejudices about a country, about a person. And in that sense, my observations, I try to be objective, but I cannot say that they are totally value-free. My book is also devoid of what I call analytical parameters. I try to write it as a person, you know, without having a theory about this, you know, that because Russia was under the Tsar for so long, uh, therefore democracy, you know, I tried to write it in the way I saw it as a person. And that's why you don't see many footnotes. There is no bibliography. And so whatever conclusions I've come uh, in my book, uh, if they happen to, to, to coincide with the views of other experts, that's merely coincidental. In conclusion, I would like to say no foreigner can actually claim to have or to be a font of all knowledge of the country. I think only Russians can, can claim, Russian experts, of course, on themselves, only they can claim, make such a claim. So in that sense, I'm happy here today to, to hear what Professor Pushkov has said. And I also look forward now to P Professor Lukin and Mr. Gavri Lenkov to add to our knowledge of the country. Thank you very much to all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chiang. May I now invite Mr. Bilahari Kausikan, former ambassador of Singapore to Russia, to give his remarks. Mr. Kausikan, please. Well, I will be very brief because you are not here to listen to me, but I want to add my congratulations to those of others, to Chris Chang. He was my deputy chief of mission in Russia during that difficult decade. And I think he has done an extremely valuable job of explaining Russia from an angle most Singaporeans do not see. We have two distinguished pan panelists. Your, you have your bios. The bios are available online. I won't waste time introducing them. I want to ask them a simple question to start off this panel discussion. As a number of previous speakers have said, most Singaporeans are not well informed about Russia and what they think they know about Russia usually comes from Western sources which are not, not always the best balanced source to learn about contemporary Russia. So I would like to ask our two distinguished panelists, starting with Evgeny and then uh, Alexander, what is the one thing, in your opinion, Singaporeans ought to know about your country to give them, to give ourselves a balanced view of Russia? Evgeny, please, can you start? Thank you. Yeah, I think, uh, do you hear me now? Yes, so, we can hear you. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So thank you for this um, introductory remarks and for the question. And I really want to congratulate Chris with a very interesting book. And uh, uh, just let me go ahead with uh, an answer to this question. I don't think that uh, one thing will be sufficient uh, to talk about Russia. It's a big country, big economy, very diversified. and uh, if I were to be concise, I would say that Russia is resilient to shock, more resilient than it used to be. Then I would add that it's reluctance, um, mentioned reluctance to grow. We have seen that in the past uh, 10 to 12 years, economic growth was very sluggish. But at the same time, I would also add that the economy is gradually evolving. So it's at least three things. And if I have time, I may um, clarify it a bit. What does it mean? First of all, resilience to shocks. We remember 92, 93, a very long period of uh, deep recession in Russia. Then it was um, you know, followed by a bounce back later on. Uh, in 2008, 9, there was a difficult period as well. It was much deeper contraction in 2009. Uh, and uh, in recent years, uh, the difficult year for Russia was 2015, when the oil price fell and sanctions were imposed on the, on the, on the, on the country. But uh, expectations at that time were very gloomy. So many people expected the Russian economy to contract deeply for 5 6% and the recession was lasting longer. In fact, it was only one year of recession, minus 2%. So this year, expectations were also very good in the second quarter when uh, the pandemic hit the country and uh, lockdown was imposed in many cities. And people also expected 6-7% contraction GDP. Most likely we'll have around 3.4-3.3% contraction. 
So it's uh, resilience is illustrated by the numbers. And when uh, you want to know about Russia, I would uh, advise not to read the headline news. Look at the numbers. The numbers are more <laughs> flashing and they, they reveal more. So what's next? I think what's important. Oil price, uh, I think this is also the most commonly quoted factor affecting Russia, but just recall 2013 when the oil price was very high, uh, close to $110 per barrel, no sanctions, but the economic growth was sluggish. It was only 1.8%. In 2017, the oil price was half of that, $55 per barrel, but the economic growth was also 1.8%. So what we have seen uh, in, in recent years, it's really, Dependence on the oil price of the Russian economy is easing, not only growth-wise, but also if you look at the, the structure of the budget revenues, uh, it's gradually a smaller portion of uh, federal budget revenues originates in the oil and gas sector. So it means that some structural change is occurring, but once again, most important that the economy uh, in the, I would say, more or less normal circumstances, is uh, still was unable to demonstrate faster growth, around 1.5, 1.3% on average in the past years. So what's uh, the problem? I would say probably uh, one of the issues is that the dominance of the big companies uh, who are more capital intensive and who are less adaptable to the uh, uh, changing circumstances. Uh, the share of small businesses, which used to be rather small in the past uh, years, uh, around 22% uh, three years ago, so the latest available number for 2018 suggested the uh, share of small business in the economy, small and medium-sized business, was around 20%. And I'm afraid that this year it's even smaller. So the most adaptable and the most, uh, I would say, motivated uh, part of the business is very small. That's why their contribution to overall um, economic growth is, is, is very, uh, it's minimal. So again, uh, I don't want to spend uh, too much time. I was uh, limited by around uh, five minutes. I tried to advise uh, to look at the details, um, uh, what happens in the country, what's, uh, uh, the, what is happening uh, outside, but uh, I believe that, uh, especially uh, in, given that in the years to come, maybe even for a decade, we'll see more difficult relations between Russia and the West and Europe in particular. Uh, Europe was always the most important trade partner for Russia. I am less optimistic than Chris in the outlook for, for the next year, uh, next years uh, uh, regarding Russia and uh, the Western relations, Europe in particular. Russia, with the dominance of big companies, became an easy target for sanctions. So, as we have seen, Russia now was able to somehow adjust to this new regime. But it's one of the factors which doesn't allow the economy to grow fast. But at the same time, it stimulates structural change. So, I think that uh, uh, if uh, regulations will be more investor friendly for local small businesses, the economy will be able to grow fast then it will be more even more multicolored the economy. So thank you. I, I think I'll stop here. If there will be questions, I'll be happy to, to answer. And once again, thank you, Chris, for, for the interesting book. Thank you, uh, Yevgeny. Uh, over to you, Alexander. Hello, Alexander, can you hear me? Professor Lukin? Oh, sorry, you switched off my mic. So okay. uh, just to make it clear, do you need just one thing? Or, uh, I no, have you to can take your time. I mean, I asked for one thing, but you can give us several things. <laughs> okay. Then the first thing and the most important for ordinary people, I would say I would mention the difference in geography. And let me give you just some figures. I counted here that the territory of Russia is 23,286.6 times larger than that of Singapore. And uh, the population is only 26 times larger than that of Singapore. So Singaporeans should understand that it's a huge country and in most places, very few people live or, or nobody lives there. It's just forest. So, 
And now temperature. Uh, well, we know temperature in Singapore, in Russia, in the summer, it's in most places is like 20 to 30 plus centigrade, which is a little less than in Singapore. But in winter, in some places, it can be up to minus 70, uh, minus 70 centigrade, uh, which is, of course, not at all uh, like Singapore. Uh, the average is about 20, 20 and minus 20, minus 30 is normal. So we are very different. And there is a theory, by the way, uh, coming from ancient Greeks, people like Hippocrates and Aristotle and later in Europe uh, by Montesquieu, that the character of the people is formed by climate. And they also wrote, the Greeks did, that in the northern climate and cold climate, people tend to be good warriors, but they do tend to be uh, not very good in trade and not very good in organizing the society. So who knows, maybe, may, 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 maybe they were right. <laughs> yeah. uh, so, and another thing more serious, well, this is also very serious, of course, is that uh, people in Singapore, I would say, should understand that Russia uh, only uh, about 30 years ago, even less, uh, yes, about 30 years ago, freed itself from a very brutal, brutal totalitarian regime, uh, which uh, actually eliminated the entire classes of the population of, uh, of the people who were able to think in a kind of independent way. Uh, the educated classes, and they were either physically uh, killed or had to leave the country. And very few countries, probably no country in the world experienced that. Uh, had this experience. Uh, if you compare it to Germany, in Germany there was a brutal regime uh, of Nazis, but it was a very short time. We had like several generations of that. So we are now a free country, but the way of thinking is still influenced by that time. And uh, we probably need several generations to come out of that, so to to to, to raise new people who would prepare, who would be prepared to think in a more independent and uh, more kind of creative way. So Russia has its problems, it's um, settling them and it's solving them, uh, but it needs time, I think. So, and, and that's why I like uh, Chris's book and other, bo other books of, the, uh, of, um, of Singaporean authors and many diplomats wrote these books like uh, Ambassador Kaosikan, I, I read everything basically that he writes and quotes, co co quotes it often. His thoughts, I read, um, I read before uh, writings by book by Ambassador Mark Hung also about Singapore. He wrote a very good book because we need this um, kind of um, outside perspective on Russia and on other societies. Uh, and I especially like uh, the Singaporean or generally Southeast Asian intellectual tradition because it's a very interesting society societies that you have in that part of the world, they are not uh, as uh, one-sided as Western tradition, but it's not completely Asian because Singapore, for example, of course, has absorbed a lot of different cultures, including Western, uh, European, uh, Indian, uh, Muslim, and, and whatever. So we li uh, I like very much, and I think it's very important for, for Russia to be seen and described from, the, uh, from kind of outside tradition. 
uh, and this is this helps us to understand us better uh, ourselves better. For example, because people to, usually tend to take everything that they have good for granted, but at this, but what is bad they criticize this sharply. I like that Chris's book. Be, his first impressions of Mo which describes in the in the beginning the, his first impressions of Moscow, he says, Moscow has very wide th streets and avenues, and I thought, well, I didn't even think of that. I thought it was normal, but you know, if Singaporeans think that it's good, it may be really good because because it's important because it's, it means that the Soviet government were building wine streets, but there were few cars, but they were kind of looking in the future. Now we had a lot of cars and these large, uh, broad streets really, really help us. So you, you, see, you see small things like that help us very much to understand good things we have and also bad things we have. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Alexander. We still have about seven minutes to go. Are there any questions from the audience? Henrik, do you, have you received any questions in the chat room? I don't see any questions from the audience. So let me ask both of you uh, a simple question. Um, I think, how do Russians look at Singapore? If you look at Singapore at all. I think Professor Lukin is quite correct. Uh, to emphasize the difference of size. I used to tell some Russian friends and, that you can take Singapore and drop us in Siberia and we will never be found again. <laughs> right? Because it's such a vast country. But how does a vast country like Russia look at a tiny city-state like Singapore? Can you share your impressions? First with you, Alexander, and then Evgeny. Yeah, Alexander first. Okay, oh, they're keeping switching off my microphone. But um, well, Russia has a tradition of uh, thinking about Singapore. I remember even in the beginning of the 20th century, there was a famous uh, song by a Russian author, uh, Mr. Vertinsky who later immigrated and came back, who, who, who sang about uh, banana and lemon kind of Singapore. But this was, of course, kind of a mystical country, which uh, almost like of a, of a fairy tale. This was not, a, of course, of a... Uh, people knew very little about real Singapore. It was like a faraway place, you know, where people like to travel, but, but not real. But uh, I think that now, of course, few people know Singapore very well, but I would say there are several things that uh, at least experts or even a broader circle of people would know about Singapore. First of all, that it's a small but very effective country, and uh, many people know um, the founder of it, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, and how he created effective economy and at the same time fought corruption. Fighting corruption is an important question in Russia. And um, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew experience, especially when he wrote in his book that the first thing he did was to put his friend to jail. Uh, this, 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 this idea is very popular in Russia, I would say. Uh, and uh, then I would call, I, I, would, I would think about Singaporean diversity. Uh, as, as they say in India, it's a society based on the principle of uh, unity in diversity, that it has uh, uh, many ethnicities, many different. Uh, you know, four official languages, many ethnicities, many uh, religions and traditions, but at the same time, it's one country and it certainly has a uh, kind of uh, 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 
uh, I would say national values and national policy, which is which is also very interesting because Russia is also a very diverse country, and it's 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 important for us to be not just uh, a country of one ethnicity, but somehow to create a system of cooperation between uh, various religions, various ethnicities, and uh, various regions. Thanks. Thank you. Evgeny, do you have to, anything to add to that? Um, maybe just very little. Alexander already mentioned a lot. I would probably also add that uh, when the Russian people think about Singapore, it's about education, especially in recent um, decades, which became very known and very advanced according to all the rankings, uh, universities, uh, uh, schools. Uh, normally, universities are very uh, highly ranked in Singapore, and this is very much appreciated by, by, by Russia. And uh, when also Russians think about Singapore, I would say uh, it's not so many similarities, uh, as was already mentioned, the size of the economy and um, <clears throat> uh, diversity of the economy, the structure of the economy. Um, but it's very impressive that um, even though the country is uh, geographically small, it was able to grow without any uh, natural resources. And that's what uh, I think probably remains a kind of, not a mystery, but is very much appreciated by the, by the uh, Russian Singapore watches or people who are interested in the Asian um, countries. But uh, it's always... Uh, uh, very interesting to compare the regulatory environment in Singapore and in Russia and uh, what can be improved in, in, in the country, uh, even in Russia. So it's, um, as I said, it's mostly positive. I, I never had anything negative and uh, thought about Singapore. Thank you. I have a few questions from the audience, which I will take although it will bring us a little bit over time, if that's all right with the organizers. The first question is um, from Ariel Tan, who says, who describes herself as a fan of Russian literature, the classic literature, Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, Gogol, and so on. And the question to the panel is whether you, you think these classics of Russian literature are still relevant to understand Russian society and Russian character. Either of you can answer this. Any, any of the panelists can answer this. The question is, are the classic Russian authors like Dostoevsky, Tolstoy and so on still relevant to understanding Russian society and Russian character? Well, I can try. Well, oh, please, please. Well, if we are talking about the great Russian literature of the 19th century, uh, it is relative in a way. Of course, Russia is a different country. So if you want to find uh, same streets or same buildings, you can do it, but not always. Uh, but of course, to understand what Russianness is, for example, uh you can you can um, uh, sometimes uh, read about like Russian understanding of nature, Russian understanding of uh, religion. These things uh, I think because it's a different society, but uh, because Russians also, raise on these books, they read them, and they, their understanding of the world is close, maybe, maybe also uh, kind of, they, they have an inherited their tradition mostly from, from literature. So I think it's, that there are two aspects, yes? You, 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 it, it's not, it, these books, the society they describe is of course very different, but the way of thinking is in a way uh, a bit similar. Thank you. Evgeny, do you want to add anything to that? 
again, very little. I think it's relevant uh, to read classics, not only for Russia, but also any other country, because it's uh, cultural traditions and uh, uh, classics, whether it's literature or music, it shapes the societies, I think, and it shapes the society in general. And uh, what is relevant, I think, most important, uh, many Russians, they want, they like to look inside themselves to think about uh, their inner life. And that's what uh, Russian literature, the classical literature is about, especially Dostoevsky. I think it's very important to read it maybe not only once, but reread such uh, classical books. Thank you. I have time maybe for one question and then I'll give the panelists a little time just to for final thoughts. The question is from uh, Ms. Lily Ong. And I guess it's for you, uh, Alexander, because you are a China specialist. The question is, by reverting to a highly centralized uh, system of power and control, is China repeating a mis the mistake made by the Soviet Union? No, sorry. Is China repeating the mistake uh, made by the Soviet Union? Where will this take them and how does Russia view this trajectory? The Chinese trajectory, I mean. Third answer would be, I don't know. <laughs> because uh, China, of course, is a very different society from that of the Soviet Union because China uh, accepted uh, market economy and its economy is very effective while Soviet economy has never been effective. Uh, so, uh, but I don't know where it leads to. We should wait and see. Uh, China may have a lot of problems uh, in the future because they, they do have a lot of problems. And uh, But the Chinese themselves claim that they have found a new way of development. Well, who knows? It's a big country. Well, I, I, I would say, uh, thinking about think Singapore, I would, I would say that the big problem about China is whether China is going to become a big Taiwan or a big Singapore. Taiwan meaning like completely westernized China type society and Singapore is uh, a bit more organized, I would say, but uh, at the same time, very effective. But we don't know the result. So let's wait and see. I think that's a very wise answer. Nobody can see the future. Evgeny, do you want to add something? Maybe again, very little. I don't, uh, I fully agree that we don't know uh, what will happen in China, but uh, it doesn't look very similar to what happened uh, in the Soviet Union because China still remains a highly important manufacturing economy and it will be so. The Soviet Union was very different in this regard. So, uh, from the economic point of view, I don't think yet uh, China is very close to the uh, period similar to what was seen in the in the in the 80s in, in the Soviet uh, Union. Um, politically, it's again a very difficult uh, issue, very difficult question. Even though. I don't see such an internal pressure from China. I'm not a China specialist, but I don't see much internal pressure from the Chinese society and the and strong demand for political change. And don't forget that Soviet Union was a completely closed economy and a closed society. China is very open and uh, it is getting more open to the foreign culture, to foreign uh, influence. So it could be a very different uh, path for the Chinese uh, society and the economy to evolve, not to similar to the Soviet Union, most likely. Thank you. Okay, we have gone over time, but I will give both the panelists, starting with Genny and then Alexander, uh, say two minutes each for any final thoughts you have. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, final thoughts. Once again, uh, I really enjoyed reading the book and uh, while uh, participating in this panel, I somehow tried to summarize uh, what was written there from culture towards um, future political relations between 
Russia and the West, it covers a lot. What I would also add, what I didn't uh, mention in the past um, during my presentation, uh, maybe if we come back to the Russian economy, uh, Russia still has a, a huge potential, as we all know, to, to grow faster. And uh, what may help uh, the economy to uh, grow, uh, to deliver strong growth and uh, strengthen in the future as well, is a fiscally conservative um, economic policy. What allows uh, the Russia to be fiscally conservative? It's uh, what makes it more resilient to shocks, but at the same time, what uh, doesn't allow the, the economy to grow, to grow fast. It's the dominance of cash-rich big companies. Uh, whenever it uh, happens outside, they have some fat and uh, they, can, they don't uh, claim for additional, much additional support from, from the state, as opposed to many European countries, which are highly dependent, especially this year, from the funding from, from the government, like in France or even the UK. So, but uh, fiscal conservative, if Russia will continue to be uh, thrifty in spending money, not throwing too much, not to repeat what the Soviet Union uh, was doing in the past, not to uh, go ahead with a huge mega project, but allow more diversification on the ground to, to allow small independent businesses to evolve, to grow, then the economic growth will be more uh, sustainable and fast. Thank you. Alexander, final thoughts? Well, uh, the, I like books like that of Chris. Uh, my favorite uh, book in world literature, uh, one of them, apart from Russian books, is uh, Halliver's Travel by Jonathan Swift. Uh, be, because this guy create, invented a uh, and imaginary, imaginary countries to have a perspective, an outside perspective to describe British society at the time. So Singapore is so different from Russia that Chris did not have to create an imaginary country to, to, have, to have such a far away and objective uh, point, point of view. Uh, and uh, as I said, it's a very important and one of the most interesting perspectives in the world because uh, Singaporean perspectives is uh, not exactly European or Western. Uh, Western perspective has become more, more, is becoming more and more ideological and biased. And, you know, if you read American books on Russia, the, they would basically tell you that you must do this and you must do that. And in the end, you'll become, your people will become as happy as, uh, say, Libyans or Iraqis. Uh, if, you are really, uh, if you are really lucky, you'll have uh, such brilliant and wise presidents like Mr. Trump yeah. or even <laughs> Biden. I'm not, I'm not sure if we are all in, in that game and would be very happy about it, but it's Singaporean perspective also is not typically Asian because as I said, it absorbed uh, a lot of influences and it's intellectual, which is uh, a rare case in this uh, world of, uh, you know, memes and, uh, you know, dictums and uh, whatever, uh, where people just, many people just don't think or, uh, and use other, other people's uh, predetermined ideas. So I, I would like to read more from Chris and I would be very happy to see him in Russia again. And uh, the role of Singapore, I think is very important for us because um, you know, Russians always discuss when they meet uh, together or usually they meet you know, two, three people together they, the, the, that's a typical Russian group. Uh, so they, they usually discuss things like uh, how to make Russian economy more effective or how to make Russia a freer country and, and whatnot. And I think the Singaporean experience, which is uh, both uh, quite free and, and especially effective economically, I think it would be very important for us to understand. Thanks. Well, thank you all. I 
must apologize to the members of the audience who had submitted questions, but we have gone far over time. And it's very good to see some old friends. Edwin, Igor, how are you? You're looking good, you know, Igor. All right. Well, thank you all. I give it back to Hendrik to wrap up this uh, session. Thank you, panelists. Thank you, Mr. Kausikan. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of the WSPC RSIS virtual book launch. We are pleased to announce that the book is on sale at a limited time special launch discount of 20%. Details of the discount will be shown on the screen right after this. On behalf of WSPC and RSIS, thank you for joining us today and have a pleasant evening. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you, Alex. I see Alex, Leo. Everybody. Uh, good to see you.